G'day, I'm Tim Thompson, and welcome to an episode of Over the Fence that I'm really excited about. Today, we get to speak to Dr. John Pickard from Macquarie University, who's one of Australia's experts on fencing technology and the history of fences through from the 1850s to modern day. I'm really looking forward to this discussion with John. He's a tremendously interesting bloke who's had a amazing career. We're going to start talking to John about his history in ecology, then we're going to move into his research on fences, and then finally talk about his passion project, which is the history of fencing strainers and fencing posts. For those of you who watch to the end, there's an invitation for John too to get involved and find out a little bit more about the history of your own fencing materials if you have anything of interest. So stick around to the end. I hope you enjoy this interview. I had a tremendous amount of fun talking with John and I hope you enjoy the conversation as well. As always, if you like this video, hit the subscribe button, give it a thumbs up, got no idea how much that helps. Let's get into it. Over the Fence with Dr. John Pickard. John, thank you very much for your time today. I'm sure we're gonna get a lot out of this discussion. I'm really excited to talk to you. You are a bit of an authority on fences here in Australia. You've done a certain amount of research on it and you're becoming well known for your knowledge on the technology behind fences. Um, but your career started out in a very different way. For the first decade or so in the 1970s, you mainly worked for the Botanic Gardens in New South Wales. Um, yeah, that's and then, right, doing vegetation uh, surveys. Doing vegetation surveys, and I suppose that that will make sense in time because that led to what you're doing now with fences, didn't it? Yes, oh, very much so. You decided in um, about 78 that you needed a bit of a career change and that you decided that you wanted to do something interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it was a, a very easy decision. Um, a, a job came up in, in Antarctica doing a vegetation survey which is what I'd been doing already. Um, yep. But Antarctica was a place I always wanted to go to. And uh, this was an opportunity. So you, you worked at several of the bases there. You worked at uh, Mawson and at Davis. Yeah, that's right. Um, I was primarily based at Davis, um, which is on the edge of a, of a 300 square kilometre low hills. They, they only go up to about uh, 200 metres or so. So it's not steep peaks or anything like that. And most of it's ice free, so you can walk around in it during summer and even through winter. And so I was out working there pretty much all the time doing field work. And um, I was even out there on the coldest day we had, which was minus 40. That work then led to you going on to Canada um, and getting a fairly prestigious scholarship as a postdoc to work yeah. over in Canada on, on glaciers, is that correct? Yeah, that's that's right. And I ended up working on uh, a fairly remote mountain up in the Yukon Territory. And it was completely different to Antarctica because Antarctica is basically an ice sheet. And this was where I was working were essentially alpine mountains with very short glaciers. And after working on an ice sheet, glaciers in the mountains in Canada were dead easy. And you actually wrote a book on... Um on geomorphology in Antarctica. I mean, you're, you're quite a well-known scientist in that field. But then you moved again and you went and worked for um, the Western Lands Division. Yeah, that's, that's right. For the New South Wales government. Yeah, that was a, a really a complete change. I went from being a scientist to being an administrator. And mm. that was a bit difficult. And strangely enough, it was also a loss of status. I was, to, to my scientist colleagues who I knew quite well, I was no longer a scientist. I was now a paper pusher. Right. But you never stopped being a scientist, did you? Because you no. actually used that job to conduct your own research um, yeah. on what became your passion and what actually became your second PhD, which is the impact of fences on the environment. Yeah. Can you talk us through a little bit how that worked? The question I was trying to answer was a simple one that, that has bedeviled semi-arid management, semi -arid land management, and that is what was the effect of and the impact of European occupation of semi-arid Australia? And so I was looking, I, I was working on 
um, a, a cluster of properties near Whitecliffs in western New South Wales. And I, while I was at the Western Lands Commission, I was collecting the archives of all of those properties. We had archives going back to 1870s. And I was able to use that to try to put together a coherent story on what, it, what, it, what it had actually happened. And to you very much, the role of fences started to play a, a pretty pivotal role in your understanding of, of Western impacts on, yes. on the plains. Yeah, the, 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 the keys to understanding the management in semi-arid zones are the location of fences and watering points. And while I was doing my surveys out there, I was noticing that there were these old fences all over the place. And I was mapping those and also using the survey plans in the archives to map them as well. And there were a major changes in technology in the fences. And they'd been, in some cases, they'd just been abandoned and, you know, more or less rebuilt somewhere else. But my focus at that time was primarily on the land management side. And it so, so changes in technology of fencing had profound impacts on the management of the landscape and the effects of the landscape. Yeah, very much so. And, and, there, and there was one pastoralist in particular from the turn of the 19th century, a, a South Australian called Peter Waite, who developed a, a radical, radically new system of fencing of small paddocks, each with its own watering point. And he was the first to do that. And the, the area where I was working, he had originally owned an, an awful lot of it. And so there, there were the relics of his management style. So it gave you a point of comparison with contemporary large paddock management yeah. systems and set stocking, where yeah. you saw a tremendous impact of just, just the way that we <coughs> arrange fences in the landscape. Yeah. It, 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 it's sort of interesting that everybody knows that if, if you're going to use fences properly, then you should be fencing out different land types. So you fence out mm. hills from valleys, from salt lakes and so forth. But as everybody who's ever driven around the landscape knows, fences run in straight lines. They go up over the tops of hills, down across the valleys, across the salt lakes and up the hills on the other side. Um, and interestingly enough, fencing out land types was first described in England probably in about the 15th century and we're still not doing it. And there's good technical reasons for it. Building a fence around a convoluted land type is expensive. It's cheaper yes. to just run the fence in a straight line. Yeah, yeah, and to push things out of the way. Now, oh, yeah. fencing, fencing in Australia had a huge environmental impact. Um, mm. You've described the number of trees, for example, that were removed early on just to provide the fence posts to, pr to yeah. put fences up. Can you go into a little bit of that detail for us, John? Before we had iron and then steel fence posts, all the posts were made out of wood and they were cut locally. And so in the Western Division of New South Wales, which is 42% of the state, I did some calculations based on the work that I'd done and checked this against some work that some other people had done. And we calculated that there was probably about 20 million fence posts had been used in to fence the Western Division. And if you assume that you, you might get two out of each tree you cut down, that's still 10 to 20 million trees were cut down just to provide fence just posts. Just for fences. Not for clearing for, for farming or anything like that, yep. purely for fences. And, and in some cases, the impact on local populations of good fencing trees was fairly devastating. But probably more interesting was what we found out by using fences as, as an environmental indicators. And traditionally, people get justifiably worked up about erosion and they study erosion. It's We found that it was much more productive for us to look at the sedimentation. If you're going to erode, if, if material is eroded, it ends up somewhere, that's the sediment. And we were finding partially buried fences and they mm. provide first-hand evidence of landscape change. And so, for example, we were mapping fences that were built in the 1890s 
they were recorded on survey plans in the 1890s and all that was visible of them was maybe six or seven inches sticking out of the ground. The rest of the fence had been buried by the sediment that had been eroded from elsewhere. So you're using, you were also using fences almost like growth rings on a tree oh, yep, um, exactly. to, to figure yep. out the, the amount yep. of erosion, when it was occurring, when it had occurred. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and you can do that because every single post is a, is a depth indicator. And That's fantastic. When, and when you've got lots and lots of fence posts, it's great. It makes for and, a very, very accurate survey, mm, I'd imagine. And, and it's not just there. In, in South Australia, in the 18, mid-1880s, 1890s, the South Australian Railways built very, very expensive iron fences. And some of those are now com almost completely buried as a result of erosion from farmland north of the infamous Goiters line, where, yes. where, where people believe that the rain followed the plough. Um, yeah. yeah, well, it didn't. <laughs> no, no, we have a we have a uh, a tremendous story about that goiters line. It's it's a line where you get uh, less than ten inches per year yep. of rainfall um, if you move above it in Australia. And there's some um, some pretty tragic stories about people trying to move up into the Flinders Ranges and and farm in wet years, and they thought everything was sustainable and great. That's They'd right. Townships and railways. And then we went into about two decades of drought and everything failed and they all moved away. And it's yep. it's quite tragic to actually visit those places to this day, isn't it? And see oh, those those yeah. old cemeteries and churches and, and, and railway and, and, stations. And, and, and abandoned ruined buildings. And, and every time I see those, mm. I think of the heartbreak that was involved in that. There was a spirit of optimism. It, it yes. And back in... When I'm interpreting those things, I don't blame people for that. Um, there was a period of optimism um, and they were literally ignorant of the nature of the climate and didn't understand that it was essentially a droughty environment with occasional good years. But and they just, skip, just so happened to pick a couple of good years to start, that's, didn't that's, they? That's correct. What but a tragedy. Skip, but skip forward to 1901 when there was a Royal Commission into Western New South Wales and they explained it very clearly that it was a droughty environment punctuated by good years. Mm. But bizarrely, here we are 120 years later and we're still making the same mistake. There are still people who think that it's a productive high rainfall environment and it's not. It's a mm. droughty environment and it needs to be managed that way. Now your your work and your surveys on fences was, was sprang out of a desire to investigate their impact on the environment and and particularly western farming techniques on the environment but from that you gained a huge appreciation for and a love of fencing technology can you tell me a little bit about that John The first fences that were built here were were all log and and the first fences were in 1788 skip forward a couple of decades and people were building post and rail fences, a, a direct import from England, but they are expensive. If you're a squatter out on the plains in Victoria or, or in New South Wales, you didn't own the land and the government could kick you off if they were game to do it. Mm. And so it was far cheaper to use a, a log fence and log fences were literally just trees cut down, laid end to end and piled up with brush and branches. And they were very, very common and widespread, and they worked. Um, skip forward another few years to 1840, when the first wire fences were built in Australia, in South Australia, and people then realised that here was a new technology, and it was cheaper and more effective and lasted longer. And Australia fell in love with the wire fence from that point forward, didn't, yes. didn't we? Yes, yes. And we, there was... You were you were saying that there were something like 300 different types of fence strainers that have been patented or brought out in Australia? Yes, um, but what you have to remember is before 1880, then all the fences were plain wire. Barbed, yep. wire, wasn't, barbed wire wasn't used. And But the key thing about a fence, as you say, is a wire fence, the horizontal bits, which are the, actually the barrier, the wire, the bits of wire, if they're not tight, the fence is ineffective. And so mm. 
the development of wire fences sort of gave birth to the development of wire strainers. And we have been very, very inventive with wire strainers. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous and rich history in such a short period of time within Australia. And we've used those fences and that straining technology to completely change the landscape. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the two, the, the two are inextricably linked, fences and the Australian landscape now. Yeah. But, but it's like um, it, 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 any tool. If, if you want to use nails, you've got to have a hammer. Um, yes. if, if you want to use screws, you've got to use a screwdriver. If you want to use wire fences, you have to use a wire strainer. And it's certainly, it, it, there's a little subculture in Australia of people that collect old tools and wire strainers. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you're well known within that subculture. Well, well, I'm getting that way. But, but yeah. what we have to remember is it doesn't matter what the thing is. Um, if you remember the fabulous ABC show on, you know, call, I think it was called Collectors. Yes. Whatever the item is, there's someone somewhere who's collecting them. Collecting now, now, whether it's thimbles, dolls, teaspoons, wire, or fence posts, wire strainers, there's somebody collecting them. What's and, your collection numbering these days, John? Um, I don't regard myself as a serious collector uh, for, for several reasons. One is it costs too much money. But secondly, mm. there are, there is one very, very good collection in public ownership in Museum Victoria, the Jack Chisholm Fencing Collection, which has got about 300 strainers in it. There's a couple of others on in private hands, but in public exhibitions, and there's a number of collectors. But what I'm doing, the, the ones that I'm buying these days are primarily modern fence, modern strainers, because the Jack Chisholm Collection essentially ends in about 1980. And so I'm buying modern strainers. And when I finish my research, I'm going to give the lot to Museum Victoria to extend their collection. That's brilliant. Yeah, except it's costing me a bloody fortune. <laughs> uh, so fences are important in our psyche. They define our wealth. Um, they, they, uh, the very least express to people that land is privately or publicly owned. They can keep stock in, they can keep pests out, but at the end of the day, essentially, um, the, the way that we put fences up hasn't changed very much in a, in, a, in a hundred or so years. We tend to still put them in straight lines. We tend to still have square corners. We tend to still fence across the landscape. Uh, myself, you know, I was, I was fencing across a gully only a couple of weeks ago. Um, I suppose the important learning that comes out of your research, John, is that we need to now, with newer technologies, change the way that we fence off the landscape and change the way that we divide the landscape up so that we can actually have more sustainable farms. You see new technology coming in and replacing fencing in time? I think we need to distinguish between two sorts of fences. The ones that are on boundaries, in other words, this side is mine, that side is yours, I've yep. got really valuable stud animals over here. You've got a bunch of mongrels and they're full of diseases and I don't want your lousy animals near mine. So that's a boundary fence. But within the property, the paddock fences are the ones that really determine the way in which stock and crops are managed. And mm. with the new technology now through G GPSs and satellites, you can put a, an ear tag onto a cow or a sheep and you can track its movements. You can also program it that provided the animal stays within a circumscribed area, then everything's fine. If it tries to go outside that area, there's a buzz sounds in its ear or it gets a little bit of an electric shock, a bit like an electric fence. Mm. Um, and, and the animal learns to stay within the area where it should be. So my prediction is that in another 20 years, we'll, we'll see a progressive replacement of many of those internal fences with the GPS tracking, what, you know, what people call virtual fencing. And we'll probably combine that with um, NDVI imagery from yep. satellites and things like that yep. to better manage our paddocks, yeah. Yeah. to sort out how long we can graze certain areas, stocking yes. limits for paddocks and all that sort of thing. Yeah, um, but, the, but, the, but the key thing is that the boundaries between the properties will probably remain as hard fences. Um, mm. 
but the internal ones will change. But, th but this sort of thing only really applies on grazing land. If you're cropping, for example, um, if you trip around parts of Western Victoria or parts of, say, the Darling Downs or Liverpool Plains where it's purely cropping, you don't actually need a fence. Um, you don't even need a fence between me and you. All you need is, mm. you know, a couple of drunken fence posts or a, a little strip of unploughed land. That's all you yeah. need. You, you only need fences where there's livestock mm. or you want to keep out pest animals. So the big take home for us, I suppose, out of this conversation with you, John, you've done many, many years of research into fences, their impact on the environment, their impact on our culture. You would love to see a culture shift in the way that we do internal fencing. You, you accept the fact that boundary fencing can't and probably won't change, but we really need to start to rethink the way that we fence inside of our properties to better manage the land because you have seen through many, many years of research terrible impacts on the environment from poorly managed uh, grid pattern fencing that doesn't take into account what you're actually fencing off on either side. I'd be a bit reluctant to say it's entirely due to fencing. Poor management mm. is, is the result of a management decision. It's not the, yes. it's not the result of a fence. Um, and... The thing that will drive any potent, any future change will always be money. Um, fences are currently very, very expensive. A Even a fairly ordinary five wire fence will cost you five to $10,000 per kilometer. If you wanna to go to an exclusion fence, which keeps out, which is about two meters high, usually made out of ring lock or hinge joint, and, 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 and they are designed to keep out all large animals. They won't keep out rabbits or cats or foxes, but they'll keep out sheep, cattle, kangaroos, horses, donkeys, you name it. They can cost up to forty or fifty thousand dollars a kilometer. Now, when you start looking at that, that's a fairly expensive proposition if you've got a couple of hundred kilometers of fence. You know, just talk to the people up in Queensland who lost their fences in floods. Mm. But with the if you combine the, the now mandatory year tags, the life, National Livestock Identification System, with a GPS chip fitted inside it, then that may well persuade people that in the long term it's a cheaper and a better proposition. And it will allow them to, as you say, to manage the hills on their properties differently from the valleys and to selectively rest areas. And get more productivity out of them as a result. Well, that's that would be the objective, yes. Mm. But it, but it, 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 it will be a, a decision based on dollars. They're exactly the same as the decision to when people shift move from shepherding to fences, capital replaced labour because capital was cheaper and it made more money than labour. And once we have the stock regulating their own behaviour because of the ear tags, then you don't need the internal fence anymore. So you've saved $5,000 a kilometre for maybe 100 kilometres of fence, internal fence. Big mm -hmm. properties in Queensland have several hundred kilometres of internal fence. 100 kilometres at $5,000, it's half a million dollars. Not only that, but there are there are companies now that are experimenting with the idea of actually mustering by, by these yep. systems as well, so that yep. they're slowly moving the stock across the landscape towards the yards when they're, yes. when they're ready to be sold. Yeah. So the stock don't have to travel for a long distance, they don't lose condition, they're not stressed, and they go to market and fetch a higher price. Yeah. yeah. You, there's, you, there's, there's, there's some amazing things coming out of this new technology, aren't there? Well, you, you've only got to look at a mobile phone, which, which of course isn't a phone anymore, it's a computer that's got a phone tacked onto it. Mm. Um, with the ear tags, if you add in a GPS, and if, it's, if you can program that remotely, so you can sit at home in your office back at the homestead and you decide you want to move that mob of cattle or that flock of sheep away from the valley or further up the valley. So you, as you, exactly as you say, you can progressively program it. So you gradually drift them up instead of going mm. out on your quad and, and, and your dogs and, and driving them up there. Yeah, the, the, the potential for that, I think, is amazing. And once it becomes marginal or, 
or once the price differential between that sort of technology and the capital cost of fences becomes fairly slight, people will switch over. And I suppose the great take home from all of this, John, is that in your research, you found that uh, the cost differential driving new technology is going to make us farm better and look after the environment. Oh, oh definitely. For example, when, when I was a, an undergraduate studying agriculture, we had to work on farms. And I can remember sitting in, on, a, on a tractor, an open tractor in the blazing sun, ploughing up and down a, a square mile paddock, sucking in dust and ending up deaf from the noise. Compare that with tractors today, which you know will cost you anything up to half a million dollars with air conditioned cabs, and they can essentially be driven remotely with it using a GPS. Um, many cropping operations drive, plough and operate on exactly the same tracks every time, and it's all done with GPSs and mm. video cameras. That the technology is simply staggering. So I suppose, John, for the rest of us who are thinking about putting up a couple of internal fences in the next few years, the take-home message from your research has been pay more attention to your landscape, pay regard to the productivity of different classes of soils, and try and fence to those so that you can reduce the impact of your activities on the environment and so that we can move away from the square grid approach of fencing and actually start to get more productivity from the land by managing it better. I think that's the ideal, but I think that in many, many ways, it's almost unattainable. People have been saying that for hundreds of years. The Soil, mm. Conservation, in Service, Soil Conservation Service of New South Wales had that as a mantra for decades, fence out different land classes. And yet, when you drive around, you can still see the straight line fences. Um, do you think it's and, an education thing or do you just think no, it's a pure finance thing? In, in, many, in most cases, I think it's a finance thing. Um, building a fence with lots of corners in it, you, you're building yourself a maintenance nightmare. Mm. Um, and it's also much more expensive to do that. If, it, if instead of building 10 kilometres in a straight line, you've got essentially a zigzag your costs go up and quite a bit because every corner's got to have a strainer post and your gains in productivity may be fairly marginal. And in any event, whether or not the land becomes eroded is the way you manage within those paddocks, regardless of the shape of the paddocks. And it doesn't matter whether you're farming sheep, cattle, kangaroos, emus, I don't care what it is. There's a limit to the number of stock you can put on before you start having problems. And that's that's where the issue is. It's it's the management itself, not the fences. And people like Stuart Andrews would even complicate that further and say that we shouldn't also be farming monocultures of livestock. We should be sequentially <laughs> farming livestock um, to lower the impact of one particular stock on, on the environment and to increase productivity as well. So it's a very complex issue, land management. Thank you for taking the time to delve into the role of fences on the landscape and your research on that, John. You've had an amazing life story um, and you are continuing to have an impact on the way that people think about how we value the land and how we use the land. I would like to think that I've been having an impact um, in that regard. With a few individuals, I have, but overall... Um, I'd be surprised. Um, <laughs> oh, we can't end like that, John. That's depressing. Well, well, okay. I'll give you a better. I'll, 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 <laughs> you know, the collective noun noun is for a group of cattle. Yeah. It's a mob. Yeah. A group of sheep. It's a flock. Yeah. Do you know what the collective noun is for a group of academics? No. Oh no. It, what is it's it? A, it's a wink. <laughs> and and do you if I rock up somewhere and um, you know cold calling on somebody the 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 shutters go up pretty much straight away oh god yep. not another not another bloody academic out here telling me what I'm going to do well yep. I've always tried not to tell them what to do it's their business enterprise it's not mine yep. I'm an academic I'm not out there sort of trying to negotiate the vagaries of climate government policy, 
um, always being a price taker at the bottom of the pile. Um, now, whether I'm, I'm buying or selling, I'm always getting screwed by somebody. And the last thing that anybody in that situation is going to do is to listen to an academic who's never put his own money on the table with that sort of risk. Um, but what I think I have managed to do is to make it give Australians a better understanding of the history of fencing and where it fits into our agricultural and rural uh, culture. And it really is central. But strangely enough, there's almost no fencing jokes. Yeah, that is but, odd, isn't yeah, it? There's shearing jokes, the... there's shepherding jokes, but the, I, I, I have not found a single genuine Australian fencing joke. <laughs> we'll have to look for one. Well, good if luck. If you've got any good fencing jokes, please put them in the comments below. <laughs> John, thank you tremendously. John, thank, thank you very much for your time it's tonight. A, it's, a, it's a pleasure, Tim. I, I'm hoping that maybe uh, we can call on you in the future for specialised comments and that uh, yeah. we might revisit this conversation into the future. Yeah, you know, I, I, I would be very happy. And, and if, in, if, mm. any, if any of your viewers have something that they think is a really unusual type of fence or a yes. fence post, which is a real bodgy or a dropper or anything like that, a wire strainer, yep. please get in touch. Um, send, send a couple of images in to Tim and I can probably identify them for you and I'd be very happy to correspond with you about them. And certainly if anyone gets onto my website, timthompsonmedia.com.au, you will find the links to send me an email with images and I will be certain to send them on to John um, and uh, I'm sure you'll get a thrill out of seeing any unusual or uh, unique fencing equipment or even posts. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Tim. Very good, John. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, I really a, appreciate that, it. That's, that's a pleasure.